know what I'm saying? Respect to all the DJs, MC producers out there. Oh, uh. yeah. Oh, this is 98.2 on your dial. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop DJ. If you wanna hear something and you wanna get in touch with the squad, you can dial four nine. So yes, yes, y'all. Say hello. Stanford, born in 1955, primarily grew up on the east side. My home began to start in a little cubicle on Chapel Street, number 32. And from that point on, my life has been a whirlwind, believe me. You know, growing up on the east side was a glorious thing for me. Um, my family, my grandfather, Earl Ingram, my grandmother, Charlotte Dobie Ingram, uh, were the ones who, and my mother and father, who nurtured me and, and reared me. I tell you, uh, I miss those days. I really do. Uh, I miss the camaraderie, the community that we had, and, and the people, the people who made that community vibrant. You know, some say, well, you know, we were disadvantaged children and poor and all of that. Well, and I say we were rich. We were rich in heritage, rich in community, rich in love. We have family, extended family, like Aunt Ella Wise on Pacific Street, who made sure each and every one of us was in the house before them street lights came on, or we was going to get it. <laughs> yes, indeed. We, you know, uh, we have people, you know, in our community, like Isaac Park, my uncle, my uncle Bubby. And Manny Brown, Callie Robinson, all those guys who helped to rear me. Um, uh, Christine Brown, Fiend and Frank Davis. Uh, I mean, I can name them on and on and on. Lester Garner up in the village. Oh, yeah, she was another mother to me. Each one of these people had a hand in my life and probably in some of your lives. You know, you know we went through a major, major transition in Stanford. Let me backtrack it just a little bit. In 2005, I went to the Blast of the Past hometown family reunion, and I saw people there who I hadn't seen in 25, 30 years even. And all my time down in D.C., I had wondered what happened to some of those people. Some I knew about, some I didn't. Most I didn't, to be honest. But that event was the thing that actually spurred this film. Um, in 2000, I guess it was 2006, I went to Malcolm Spears' 50th birthday party, and that was a defining moment due to the fact that Michael Coleman and I walked outside, you know, getting ready to leave, and Michael Coleman grabbed my hand. He said, Carl, I know you a cameraman down there in D.C., man. He said, but tell our story. Tell us, don't let the world forget us, how we came along, how we grew up, and who we are. Because if you don't do it, it won't get done. And this man grabbed my hand, almost broke my knuckles, squeezing it. But tears came to Michael's eyes and to mine. And I said, Michael, we're going to do this. And I called, I, I called on God himself to help me because I'm not a true professional filmmaker in the sense of Steven Spielberg or the, the, you know, the Singleton Brothers or what have you, but I just picked up the camera and said, well, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. And in this journey, in the last couple of years, I've learned a lot. A lot of questions that I had was answered and a lot more questions actually arose. And... I tell you, Stanford, Connecticut, and its community, and the African-American community, is a unique community within itself. We have people who are notables who have come out of Stanford, people who have made great strides and great contributions to society. Even though we had four major transitions in Stanford, one being the urban renewal transition, where people were displaced out of their homes, where the east side became flatter than a dime, as Frank would say. You know, all the housing gone, and them all put there. We had 
the heroin epidemic that a lot of us, including myself, got caught up in. But thank God for places like the Liberation House and people who loved and cared for us to make sure that we got back on the right track. We had the cocaine crack epidemic in our city that spurred the AIDS epidemic. And many of our friends and many of our family has passed away because of it. But let me just say this. Concerning this film, there are people who you may see there who are no longer with us, who I may not even know that are no longer with us. But let me say this in assurity that God knew exactly where he wanted them to be placed from the time of their birth and their life, and they're coming on home to him. He's the judge, not you or I. No matter what circumstances they may have left this planet on, he's the judge. He knew it exactly when he was to be, they were to be brought into his bosom. So I just want to say thank God for each and every person who is viewing this, who had a hand in this. There are too many names to start naming. Believe me, there are too many. But I just want to say thank you first and foremost to the to the Blast to the Past Committee. Now, I don't know all those who are on there. I know my aunt Willie Wheeler and Keith Simmons and my, my sister Tammy Robinson, uh, Tammy Robinson Smith, <laughs> and uh, Barbara Wynn and, and Joey Fagan and, and all those who you know brought this together and the founder and the creator and the one the visionary Carl Lewis. Um, Without those people galvanizing themselves together, I wouldn't have been in that room that night. You guys wouldn't have been in that room who were there. And this thing that you're watching would have never taken place. And so it's a great domino effect. And I'm just, I'm just blessed and privileged that God honored me to, to be the vessel to do this. As I said, I'm not no Steven Spielberg or I mean, the Singleton Brothers or Spike Lee. But this is what has been put into my hands to give unto you. So I just want to say um, God bless each and every one of you guys who had anything, as I said, anything to do with this. And I hope that this has answered some questions for you, that our young people will be inspired to see that they're, like I said, notables, world famous people like Marion Meadows and Ernest Cobb and Gary Cobb who came out of here, you know, um, Judge Robinson. Dr. Yearwood, especially, who was a pioneer of the West Main Street Community Center, which is now the Yearwood Center, that if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have had that place where we came together as community and as one. So let me get out of the way so that you can enjoy this film expose. God bless each and every one of you, and may the love of God permeate through your spirit. God bless you. Bye -bye. In my journey, and getting some of my questions answered, I felt like I had to go back to our roots. And primarily our roots are in the, in the South of those who, of us who came to Stanford, or our parents, or our grandparents who came to Stanford. In my case, my grandparents. My grandfather was from Nashville, North Carolina. My grandmother from Camden, South Carolina. And so I went down South to kind of get a feel for why did, did our parents and grandparents come to Stanford. I saw some of the old housing that were just one step away from a major slave cabin. And uh, I got a feel for what it was like to see those fields of corn and cotton and tobacco that was growing at the time. You know, uh, our people had to get out of there for a better life for their children. Well, when I got there, I met up with Sarah Wilson and, and her family and had a great time. Her and I rode around and talked and I got a feel for what had happened. We'll go back to the campground. I'll take my time. You can check out the... What they do is, um, back in the day, the people that lived in the neighborhood, they lived so far apart from each other that they would all commune together one once a month in April. I mean, in October, the first, the second Sunday in October to, to the third Sunday. They would all just get together they come out here and live. Wow. So your, your dad was from Alabama? My, family, my mother's from South Carolina. Okay. Yeah. And how did you get to Stanford? Uh, my mother, as a teenager, wanted a better life than the farm life. Huh. So she, um, she went to Wilmington, North Carolina, and then migrated up to Connecticut. But my Aunt Carrie was the one that moved up to New York. She lived um. She lived someplace in New York. I don't know if it was Harlem or where. And my my mother came with her maternal aunts 
my aunt Sue, and my uncle Jesse, and my uncle Pitt moved to Stanford. And that's how she ended up in Connecticut, doing days work. Probably getting picked, picked up down at the Liggett's drugstore. Right. Until they got their own vehicle to move back and forth. And my dad used to pick up anybody that was cleaning their houses and they were waiting for the bus. And he would always pick the ladies up and bring them downtown. So they didn't have to wait for the bus. Uh-huh. No, back then it wasn't, wasn't wrong to hitchhike. They came up to Stanford because it was a manufacturing center. Uh, they came there looking for an opportunity for their children, education for their children. And um, this is a place that was actually, in one sense of the word, welcoming as opposed to how it was in the South. At this point, I said to myself, well, let me go talk with Uncle George. He's been here practically all his life in Stanford. Maybe he can tell me some things that, you know, would answer some of the questions that I had concerning Stanford, how we grew up, and what the neighborhoods were like, and what the city was like. President Roosevelt put all the people back to work and created all these jobs because before there wasn't no jobs. Now isn't that why a lot of African Americans moved from the South up here? Yes, because of work. Because because there was work. And and uh, and then they were glad to move the black from the South back from the South because um because White people saying they're taking up all the all the all the work. They taking up all the work. We can't make no money because they taking up all the work. Mm -hmm. So they were glad for you to move, all right. But now when you came up here to work, you didn't have education, right? Right. So now when you get into going to work into a factory, you had to learn how to do factory work, and you had to learn how to read and write. Because down during that time down south, it was limited reading and writing. Right. Well, they didn't give you when you when slavery time they allow you to learn to read. So since you didn't learn to read, your parents didn't teach your children to read. Mm. They wouldn't let them go to school. Mm. And then though that was go to school, the parents would pull them out of school to work on the farm. Fields. Yeah. To work on the farm. Yeah. So that would eliminate your education. So basically, from that. Stanford at that time was really a haven, a good haven. All Connecticut, them. all Connecticut was because now, now, now wasn't, yeah. there wasn't so much the factory. It wasn't so much of the factory. The wife was glad to get you because now you became maids. You became maids. You did all their work that they didn't want to do. You did them. You took care of their children. You fed their children. You cleaned their children. You sent them to school. You picked them up. You did everything that they didn't want to do. Now they got time to to stay into their education and stay into the workforce. But you didn't have that opportunity. But you are working because you're doing this here. All right, now they got these here for hotels and whatnot. You became the maid. You became the butler. You became the, the carpenter, the the door maker. The door man. Right. You been the door everything. You working. All right, you are being employed, right? And you're not in the South doing no me work, picking no cotton no more. Mm. Tobacco. Mm -hmm. Yep, she know about tobacco. That's what they did. That's about Virginia. Mm, that's nothing but tobacco country. Yeah. Virginia is where all your cigarettes come from. Yeah. Richmond area. You know, I was watching, I was watching Roots, and uh, if you look back on it, you understand a whole lot that Kuta Kente, Alice Haley's great, 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 great grandfather, came in at Annapolis and was auctioned off to John Reynolds. Now, John Reynolds was one of the tobacco... Tobacco, yeah, that tobacco Philip farm. Morris. Phil, yep, yep, uh, the Reynolds, uh, Reynolds uh, family. And there was another slave there was auctioned off to um, the Calvert family. And Calvert County is still right there in Virginia today. Sure. The Reynolds plantations and the Reynolds farms are still, still there. there. And their ancestors have fared very well from the labor of uh, blacks that for free. They, right. You know, yeah, they'll say quickly, of course, we weren't there. And they don't, oh, no, they weren't. They weren't there. They didn't inflict it. No, but they are the beneficiaries for sure. So what I, what I, what, what gets to me, Carl, is when you look at the Holocaust, 
when they talk about the six million Jews, six million Jews that were killed up in, by Hitler, all right, and they say, lest we forget, we shall never forget that. We shall never let that escape our mind. We should teach it to our children, and they should teach it to their children. As long as we have breath, we should teach this here what happened to us. Right. But they killed up more than six million black people from slavery to up until the 50s even. That's right. All right? Or just but coming from over from the from Africa this, to here. This, this, I'm talking about this when they yeah. was bringing them over. They would get killed up more. Yeah. But you know what they said? You should forget about that there. You should put all that behind you and go on with your life. Why should we just forget it, our ancestry, history, and go on with our life? Well, you can't. There is now, there's only a few black people that can talk about their great-great-great-grandfather. Right. You might be able to talk about your great-grand, your great-great-grand, but other than that there, you have no history. Only a few yeah. will have this here history, and we all to have this history. Greetings to all my sisters and brothers, all of you who have come from near and far. Gather round to hear tell of a small town as it was in the 1960s and 70s. Hear about the unique people who lived there and who made everyone who ever visited it never forget it. That town is Stanford, Connecticut. Except for the few folk who lived above Bedford Street, these people, these black Stanfordites, occupied every other corner of the town from Connecticut Avenue to Waterside, the Dyke to the Cove, Chapin to the East Side. All right, I know some of you think that I forgot an area or two, the South End and the West Side. That includes Fairfield Court, Southfield Village and Bidell Court, Clinton Avenue, Stillwater Avenue, Greenwich Avenue, Selleck Street, and high activity streets like Hawthorne Street, Henry Street, South Pacific and Pacific Streets, Main Street, and the South End and East Side. Don't forget everyone's favorite hangout, Poor John's Pool Room, and the pool spot. Urban redevelopment came along in the 60s and people moved away and those who were still there hanging in there still had to endure a lot of hardship. To get some of my other questions answered, I went to Stanford and I went to see an old friend of mine who's like a brother, Harold Johnson, to find out exactly what had happened concerning the housing situation. The taxes are outrageous. The local people can't afford to live here anymore? Can't afford it. Taxes are, you know, I mean, people were living here, that, you know, from this area. Usually two people in the house working. Right now you got people in houses, combined incomes, uh, working, you know, gainfully. And uh, able to buy houses for, you know, five, six hundred thousand, a half a million. Our taxes are based on that. <clears throat> This looks like uh, there's an aggressive situation there. Well, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just change. Yeah. I mean, you know, locals, you know, just got to pick up and get out of Dodge. Yeah. So you can't hang around here anymore. I mean, just, a, just a, like I said, it's taxes alone. Do you put the town on the garbage? Taxes alone. I mean, you're living in Glenbrook. You're going to pay anywhere from six to $10,000 a year in property tax. Just that alone? Uh, that alone. They're cheaper than gas. <laughs> <laughs> I went up downtown and went up into one of the garages and just took a look over my city. I looked over where Bell Telephone Company was on Gray Rock and saw where, in my mind's eye, where Tressa Avenue Playground once stood, Holly Place, Gray Rock, uh, the way it was, Tressa Avenue. Um, St. John's, all those streets that made up our community, Pacific Street, Brook Street, uh, the, uh, Main Street, part of Atlantic Street, that was a total, total change. For me, it was very, very, um, in one sense, painful to see, you know, um, our community, the community that I grew up in, and it was gone. And, and like I said, I, it, more questions were asked in my mind than answer that I had. I thought to myself, well, you know, 
Did the housing shortage affect everyone in Stanford, or was it just a selected few? And so um, I ran into Alita Leith, and uh, she took me down to Cummings Beach, and she showed me and talked to me concerning about the development that happened in Japan. The scale of the housing that they have over here now, they, most of these houses were redone. Okay. And the scale of the house is like twice the size it was before. It's like when their family sold the, the house mm -hmm. or the, the siblings of the people that lived in the house renovated the house and just made it humongous. I see. I see. The house is humongous. Yeah, back in the day, we couldn't go over there because it was a private beach, as they said, but I think it was just an excuse for uh, segregating the classes, let alone the races. When I went up on Boot Hill, I found some surprises, but at the same time, too, I wasn't surprised at all. Fond memories of uh, Boot Hill and this part of my grandparents and my mom, Carly, and just, you know, community down here, 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, picnicking right here, playing baseball, watching the Thunderbirds play, polycast, watching their team play. This was the famous Boot Hill, Stanford's finest. Always somebody's family. You know, you go there and say, come on, come on. You know, you were part of the family. Yeah. Eat, eat all the food. Eat right here food. on Boot Hill. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Go on, fix your plate. Yep. You know, and you fix your plate. And hey, then, you, you, want, you want something to take with you? People ain't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. Everybody out here, Memorial Day or Labor Day or Fourth of and July. And then somebody's out there playing spades or, you know, doing something. Right. You know, or sitting here just listening to music. Right. You're probably little. Yeah, because all this up here on Boot Hill, that, was that wasn't there. You can see the whole hill. Yeah. You can see this whole hill and the rocks on the side. We used to climb these rocks over here. Yeah, I remember these rocks. We used to play Army in here. Boot Hill, Stanford, Connecticut's finest mountain. Look what we found on Boot Hill. Look what we found on Boot Hill. Somebody can identify these black underwear by the lace and, in fact, their thongs. It wasn't hard to get off. They wasn't hard to get off, brother. They found right here on Boot Hill, Stafford, Connecticut. Okay? Hello. <laughs> It's crazy, man. Okay, a whole pack of camel cigarettes. Boom. They don't even make these anymore, I guess. I don't know. I don't smoke that garbage. What's some underwear? Found right here on Boot Hill. Okay. I, you know, I couldn't plan this, bud. I couldn't have planned it. I'm serious. Oh, my God. Yes. Underwear on Boot Hill. Who would have thought it? And then all of a sudden, I don't want to bring no more stuff, man. That's just perfect. Everybody got some dirt on Boot Hill, man. <laughs> well, my father, he claims I was conceived up here, so it's kind of apropos. <laughs> yeah, man, if you ain't got no dirt on Boot Hill, man, you ain't on it. <laughs> We found the pants. Alita has found the pants. Oh my God! Huh? You found the pants too? F pants too, brother. Oh man, they must be the ball up here. They must be come back home. Oh my goodness! Look at him. I don't believe this. I don't believe this, man. In a big hurry. They must knew I was on the way. Oh my God! Here comes the cameraman. Let's go! Oh my God! Oh my God! So underwear on one side and pants on the other, baby. That was that was a party up here. It was a party. Who's here? Well, but I, actually, I have you on speakerphone, and you have been recorded as I'm recording into the camera. 
Huh? Yes, I did. <laughs> you, I've been recording you the whole time, bro. I got your voice. You can't wait. That's right. And hey, check this out. We're now coming up on some shoes and some clothes that's hanging in the trees. Maybe we can find a butt bandit. <laughs> Look, look, I wish you could see this. Here's some socks. Here's some shoes. Are you still really keeping the tradition alive? They treat, yep, here's a shirt on the tree. Shirt on the limbs. Here's a pair, yep, oh, here's another shirt down here on the ground. Okay. Yep, there's some pants over here. That's right. Here it is. A pair, pair, oh, these are female. Get back. These are some female pants here because I'm looking at the embroidery around the, around the waist. Uh-oh, maybe we can find the, the humping cuppers. The humping cuppers right here. <laughs> okay, where they at? Where y'all at? Okay. Okay, blood. <laughs> Boy, if you can see what I see. All right, man, talk to me a little bit. Peace. Oh, my God. It's time to go. This is just too much. God is with me. Uh, I want you to fall off the side. We used to climb these rocks right here. Play army all up in here. These trees were not here. They were not this high. They were not this big. So in 30 years since I've been up here, it has grown. The foliage has totally taken over. concerning Stanford and Southfield Village, we didn't always live as large because circumstances that, you know, surrounded us dictated that. And let's talk about a little bit about the village, how we came up and, and, and um, your, your fondest memories. I came up, and my father's memory, uh, memories was coming up at 78 Waverly Place in a family of 10 boys and 4 girls, and the love that was there in the village, first starting in the Garner household. And outside of the Garner household, uh, it dictated an um, a atmosphere of peace, love, and, and, and community. And in that community, we all came up, and we had honor and respect one for another as a community. And that's my fondest memory because it's a loss, it's a lost art today. It's a lost thing in our community today, the togetherness that we had when we were younger coming up in Southfield Village. In my memory, Southfield Village was, uh, to me, it was like a city within a city. You know what I'm saying? Where it was, the community was so tight where it's that people could go to bed, leave the doors open, they could leave stuff in the yard, they didn't have to worry about it being uh, uh, stolen the next day they got up. Mothers, ladies could walk the village, didn't have to worry about their pocketbooks being stolen and stuff like that. But my fondest memory of the village is the talent that was up in the village, you know what I'm saying? There was so much talent, you know, in the village, but then we was, you know, like, denied of this talent because the, when they segregated the schools, you know, where is that we left from the black inner city schools with, with predominantly black and Puerto Rican, and then they bust us out, you know, to the, to, to the suburban schools, you know, to where is that now we had a, a, a play second mm -hmm. to, the, to the white athletes yeah. that was in these schools, you know what I'm saying? And we knew that we were far more better athletes, but then when we did participate into varsity sports and all the different sports and stuff, we were denied the scholarships that we yeah. felt that we, you know, rightly deserved. So these scholarships were denied to us. So now that put us back in the struggle to where is that now here we feel in that okay, they have this power over us, you know, now, you know, some of us gave up, a lot of us went on and stuff, you know what I'm saying, but, uh, but that's my fondest memory of what we was denied as, you know, black people, you know. And, and, 
and to carry on with that. Another fondest memory was that there was a lot of good examples up there um, as far as basketball, baseball, sports, um, or elders. Um, you could look up to them and they would never, I would go so far to say mislead you. A lot of the misleading came because of our desire to want to do wrong. But in the core of it, when I was from the age of four or five all the way up until 11 and 12, it was about just playing sports and trying to do good because your brother or your sister did good. And the school was great. And just, just, just atmosphere was awesome in the village, man. I mean, um, again, again, as we go, Carl, it was just love. And you felt it in the whole community. We had our fights, we had our fun, we had our rivalries, but that was part of growing up to us. It was just a great atmosphere, and we knew that when push came to shove, nobody can break the core or the backbone of the village. No one can break that, and that was the power. That was the power of unity, the power of community back then. Yeah. One of the young ladies that worked out at the, uh, the building where I'm at right now, her mother grew up with us, Henrietta Alexander. And she told her daughter, right, when her daughter uh, uh, said that, yeah, you know, Freddie uh, is going on a cruise. Freddie just bought a Mercedes and this like that. And she said, yeah, Freddie and, Freddie and his brother still got all that money from the drugs, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I wish I did. Right? <laughs> I'm telling you. You know, we went through so much money, man. It didn't mean nothing. Did. It didn't. It didn't mean it. Didn't, we didn't respect it. We didn't respect it. We went through so much money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because right. if we had kept it, we'd still be chasing it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. We would. We'd still be chasing it right now. We here. would do big money. Okay? Big money. Yes. We, 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 like it was nothing. Because we didn't, like you said, we didn't respect it. Uh -huh. Okay? We didn't respect it. We made money hand over foot, in this right. hand, out the other. But you know one thing, Carl, about talking about the village, right? Mm -hmm. As a young dude, as a young guy, right, teenager, you know, when we used to look at them high rises, we used to be up there on Presbyterian Street or wherever and stuff, right? See them high. But you know what, Carl? I seen past them high rises. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I straddle the fence, okay? Because curiosity, okay? And it, it like, uh, stopped me from getting to this point to where I'm at now. But I always did see past them high rises. Because, see, I was told by a white director, the first director of Chester Addison Center, right? And she told me at the age of 14 years old, don't never let nobody stop you from pursuing your dreams. Because she said, it, nobody can stop you but you. That's it. You know what she I'm saying? Right. And she was right. 100%. And she was a white lady. Mm -hmm. Right. It don't know? matter what color. That's color. right. Right is right. Right is right. That's, That's it. right. I don't care if you're purple. That's right. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Right is right, man. Mm -hmm. Can't get past that. And I always used to try to, you know, I mean, I probably could have went to public records, man, because when I got up to uh, be in my 30s and stuff, man, and I was going to try to look up this lady and see if she was still alive because she was an inspiration to my life, being as though we had these at, uh, uh, these centers. You know what I'm saying? See, we didn't we didn't always have to be in the streets. Right. You know, we had we had people that came in to do things with underprivileged kids. They kept us in different places, like taking us to Broadway shows. You know, Carnegie Hall. Yeah, man. That's right. You know, taking us to all these places to show us how the other half lived. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, like 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 me and you was talking, Carl. The only thing that stopped us. It's because of the trickonomics. You know what I'm saying? See, if we had known then what we know now on the outcome of the choices that we made as far as going from the sports to music into the drug game. See, no matter how far you go in the drug game, the game is designed for you to lose. You know what I'm saying? Automatically. Automatically. It's all over now. It's all over now. Yes. And, and this is what the young kids got to understand. It's all... It's all a trick. It's to get you to take that stuff. It's like everybody know. You know, there ain't no guns in, 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 in the village. There's no poppy fields. You know, there's no marijuana uh, plants in, 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 in the, in the uh, poor communities and stuff. And see, and this is all the trickonomics, you know what I'm saying, is to get the young, just like they did with us, to jump onto this, to look for the, uh, 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 what we say, the materialistic things, you know what I'm saying, to have the bling bling, you know, with the, with the whips and all that stuff, right? And all all that is, man, is, is a game.
a game for you to get into, a game that you can't even win, you know, because it's designed for you to lose any way you look at it, you know, and that's the way it is, man. You know, and then the, the thing I was telling my nephew, right, because he was a banger from out of California, he went uh, 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 to these camps out there in, in California because he was a gang banger, and, and he got into, you know, trouble doing five years, six years at the age of 13, 14 years old. Now he's up here and he's 20 years old, so now he feels as though because of his juvenile record, all this is going to hold him back. And I said, no, the only thing that's holding you back is you. Because, see, while you was out in California, you was with these gangs and you were seeing this fast money and stuff. Now you come to the East Coast and now your half-brothers here is doing the same thing. So you see the fast money. See, you don't know, you know what I'm saying, that anything beats a blank. Slow money is better than no money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this is the thing that they have to learn. But I, it, it took us a while. Yeah. Maybe it's going to have to take them a while, you know, to catch on to it. You know what I'm saying? Because, see, once I learned, Carl, how to defeat my greatest enemy, you know what I'm saying, and moved out of the way and let God work his way, mm -hmm. see, my greatest enemy was me. You know what I'm saying? That was my greatest enemy, me. You know? And that's who I had to convince that it was a better way. You know? And that's just how life is. It took, like I said, it took, it took me a while to get it. It's probably take them a while to get it. You know? well, this is the blessing, baby. That's right. <laughs> you know? And got it honestly. Yes, honestly. Every day. Mm -hmm. Every day. I didn't get nothing out of the drug game. All I got out of the drug game, man, was misery, death. You know what I'm saying? And this, all of this is coming from out of the drug game. Mm -hmm. You know? Because I would do anything. As long as it's legal. Man, let me tell you something. <laughs> Even you got 10 Mercedes in the drug game, the feds going to take them. Take them. Going to take so, everything. So let me I don't have to worry about the feds coming to try to take nothing from me today. Hello. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Uh, yeah. That's right. The African-American community has its stars in music, medicine, and education. We also shine brightly on the sports scene. Sports was not only great for the body, but for the mind also. We, as spectators, enjoyed watching African-American Stanfordites at their specialty. In basketball, we had the great Robert Spider Hayes dazzling opponents with his spectacular moves. Hey, baddest basketball player Stanford ever produced at one point. Hello. How you been, man? God, so yeah, good to see straight, you. Man. It's good to Peace. see you, man. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. I remember when, I remember when you would go down the court and just dazzle the world, brother. Before Ernest Cobb, that's right, I'm, I'm telling on you, Ernest, before, before Paul Cobb and Terry and all them, with them boys can play, Robert Lee, all them, them boys can get down, but Spider, they could, man. You, you laid the trail, you, you laid it down, man. Good seeing you, man. Good to be seen. Peace. All right. Peace, y'all. <laughs> there was also the talented Cobb family, whose members excelled in different sports. Robert Lee Cobb was stellar on the track. Paul, Terry, and Ernest Cobb were great basketball players. When Ernie, as he was called, went on to play in college and the professional ranks and has a book out and a movie deal in the works. Cousin Gary Cobb was a notable in basketball and football while at Stanford High and went on to a professional football career and a sportscaster position in Philadelphia. What's going on, man? Everything's okay, Carl. It's good to see you. Good to be seen, man. Yeah, real good. Man, I remember back in the day, brother, you and Ernest and Terry and Paul, you guys were the Stanford superstars of basketball over there. You're a wood center, man. You know, give me a little bit of your memory concerning playing up there, man, and doing what you were doing up there. First, I'd like to say Terry, Ernie, and uh, Terry and Ernie and Paul were much better basketball players than I was. I wound up being a track star, you know, so I, you know, I was into jumping and field events, so I didn't have the coordination. But I did like the game. It was very competitive playing against my brother Terry and Ernie, who just took his career to another level. And Paul, well, he had mad basketball skills. But, you know, being from the hood, that's all we did. We played quite a bit of basketball. But 
I enjoyed it, but playing in Yearwood, it wasn't a better place to play because everybody up there could play and was damn good. The gym was crowded and everybody was qualified to play. It's just that being for, with family members, strength was in numbers. We sort of like always had a, a carte blanche to play. Last but not least, we must mention softball great Elliot Buster Gray. He was the leader of Buster Gray's All-Stars in Stanford and played superior ball with teams in the Industrial League with top teams such as Polly Cass, Pitney Bowes, and the great Thunderbirds. He has also won citations from the city of Stanford and recognition from the state of Connecticut as well. All the great teams Buster has played for were the Yearwood Center, JJ's in Port Chester, New York, and GYMCA in Greenwich, Connecticut, with an amazing batting average of 681. I used to hit a lot of home runs. And the thing that nobody could understand of me hitting home runs and hit cross handed. Cross handed. And they, I've had so many people call me lies about me hitting the rocks at Scouts Cummins number four. I hit, last time I cut up with the record was, I had 50 home run in two years. And I've hit the rock about six or seven times from number four. And then we played at every Sunday, we played at Dolphin Cove. And there was a home run in Hidden Park. Oh, Lord, the Thunderbird. That was one of the most exciting teams that ever wear a uniform in Connecticut, New England State. <clears throat> there was money games. Reed pitch between his leg, behind his back, and Arnie Dixon was one of the best ball players I figured he ever lived in this state, Arnie Dixon. And we would read the last two innings, he would tell all the infielders to sit down. And there, there, the opponent to try to hit the ball. And he pitched between his leg and from behind his back, striking out the remaining the six out. He he was awesome. Ryan Blackman is a 2006 graduate of Trinity Catholic High School, and he's a lead program participant in our after school program since 1999 to 2006. While at Trinity Catholic, Ryan was the Crusaders basketball MVP and the winner of the Macy Award in 2006. I heard some mumbling over there that he could take our uh, guest star from the Yukon Huskies, but I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Ryan has continued his athletic career at Springfield College, where he's a member of the varsity basketball team. He's been awarded the Maroon Club Athlete of the Week. He's the New Mac Player of the Week Award winner in 2008. Ryan is the son of Renee and the late Theodore Blackman and is majoring in recreation and sports management. I have an award here, Youth Excellence Award, presented to Ryan Blackman, lead graduate, for his outstanding accomplishment, both academically and athletically, at Springfield College, presented on this day, May 21st, 2008. Ryan, please come up. Say special thanks to my mom. I wouldn't do it without her. Thank you. Education, good. Education is the key. It's not about everything else. It's, you can be good at education. You make it far in life. And sports is a real good key for you too. You can get scholarships and all that, and you can succeed, everybody can succeed, and I'm just happy that I made it this far. I, I, um, I saw 
where the New York Giants uh, were there tonight. You got to your award, the banquet, at the banquet. And something that um, uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen Baker, Stephen Baker said that he was very proud of you and uh, on all of your accomplishments and was glad that, um, you know, that you were being an example to younger people, you know, that uh, Stanford, Connecticut can look forward to having you and to represent it as a, as a community in the city overall. Because um, cause some people may have a, have a concept that, you know, a lot of African-American young males are not participating like at the Yoga Center and the programs and, and playing sports and academics and life skills and things like that. Now, being true or not true, you are automatically a role model. And we are proud of you that you have accomplished all that you've accomplished, not just in the area of sports and your trophies are, of course, a testament to that, but more so uh, your, your academic, your academic achievements. Dr. Yerwood was the first African-American doctor to be on the staff at Stanford Hospital in the 1950s. She was a strong advocate for drug rehabilitation in the early 1960s before it became nationally popular in the 1970s. Dr. Yerwood left a legacy to the African-American community that is still prevalent today. Her dream, like Dr. King's dream, was to ensure that the youth in the African-American community had a fair and equal opportunity to fulfill their life's goals. Due to the dedication of the center's director, staff, and volunteers who give tirelessly of their time, the Yerwood Center will continue to be a model of what can be done for today's African-American youth. In this 65th anniversary, we do hope, believe, and trust that the youth that now come through these doors will carry on Dr. Yearwood's dream for another 65 years plus. She was shocked. She had never in her life heard of after high school, not going to college. Because coming from where she was, that's how they were born and raised. College was automatic. So when she came up here, and when she came up here, we were like in a depression period. So a lot of people didn't even have the money or the funds to go to school. So that's why she wanted the children to be involved, to stay active, so that they knew there were other options out there for them. She wanted them to know that just because we were black did not mean that we did not also have a chance as everyone else. She made sure that that was emphasized. Right. Okay. But now she was the first African American, male or female. First African American female family practitioner in Fairfield County. In the whole county. In the whole county. Specializing in obstetrics and gynecology. So she's responsible for a lot of people who've been born. She delivered a lot of Stanford's babies. And, and when did that start? What year basically did that start? Well, Practice. she came up here in the late 20s. Late 20s, early 30s. So I say around like 1932, 1933. What year did she start the West Main Center? Well, the Negro... It started in 1937 in her backyard. 1937. Uh-huh. So, from 37 to... What year did she pass? She actually passed in 1987. She was a strong woman. Yes, she was. And Very I... determined. Key words about her. Determined and focused. Those are two important words that really describe Dr. Yerwood. Right. I remember that girl that had the baddest shape in the world walking past I think she got AIDS. That's what the boy told me. Got yeah, HIV? Yeah. That's, that was one of the major, major killers of the black community here in Stanford. They were dropping like flies. Yeah. And a lot of young ones, too. A lot of young ones. They were, they were getting them 
mess with them needles. And if I'd be sitting on the wall, and you know, and he could hit, well, the Ace house was right there. I'm telling you, the house, the, the house right next to that boy's home, that was the Ace house. I'd be sitting on the wall, and they, and they come by, and, and I know there ain't no counselors in there, right? <laughs> but, and they come come by, boy. Next time you look, they dead. Last summer, at the Newton's residence, Candy and Rob Newton in Richmond, Virginia, I ran into Lucine White, and she told me that she was under a divine order to put together a quilt of our loved ones, our high school mates, our family, our friends, different ones who had succumbed to the AIDS virus in Stanford. Truly, this woman is on a divine mission. Her quilt is a definite labor of love, and for me, I just had to see it. I made my way down to Richmond, Virginia to talk to Lucene concerning the quilt. And um, I tell you, it was a true uh, blessing. We came up in a time of the sexual revolution exactly. where it was about free love and everybody was with everybody and um, the bra burning and the if it, feel, if it feels good, do it time. And those behaviors along with IV drug use and interchanging needles and uh, group sex and, and interchanging sexual partners, all those things made us at risk for this epidemic. And what made you come up with the name, Call My Name, as far as your quilt is concerned? I have been involved with agencies across the country that do um, HIV AIDS ministry. And the AIDS Quilt Organization is one of the agencies that I uh, have been in contact with. And I called them about a year and a half ago about doing some, about teaching how to do the memorial panels for the AIDS quilt. And they began to speak to me about an initiative that they were doing called Call My Name. And what they were trying to do was get a hundred panels for the AIDS quilt of African American women who um, were either infected or had died from the virus. They wanted to use these panels to tour black colleges across the country to use as an educational tool to show how the face of AIDS has changed from uh, Caucasian males, Caucasian gay males, until now where the um, highest population of newly infected cases are African American and Latino women. So they were looking for these panels uh, uh, to do, to use as an educational tool. And when um, she, when they told me the name of this initiative, it really began to speak to my spirit because I, it was like I could hear the names. I had so many names in my head and in my spirit of people that I knew personally who had died from the virus. And God just began to give me a poem called Call My Name that spoke to uh, this initiative as well as the quilt that we're presenting at the Blast from the Past. <laughs> Call My Name. Call my name to remember I once was alive and I was somebody's loved one who contracted the virus that turned into AIDS and proved as lethal as any gun. Call my name because God loved me when men feared and scorned me and some even laughed at my plight but I'd bear all the ridicule over again if to others it gave sound insight. Call my name, but you must make your children aware that others for them paid a price, that they may gain knowledge about this disease and take heed to how they live their life. Call my name, celebrate me and all of the lives this memorial quilt represents. To call your attention and promote prevention then maybe our deaths will make sense. Call my name, see my square that tells you my story and declare that today is the day that you will do all that you possibly can to make HIV AIDS go away. Call my name with a prayer that we all come to live so that the last square has been made by education, wisdom, and love for each other. From this earth we cause AIDS to fade. Growing up, of course, you had older guys older than you, you looked up to, and in my eyesight, one of them was really phenomenal, that's Rodney Bass. Now, Rodney Bass has come a long, long way from the water side. 
Rodney Bass is now principal of Stafford High, the school I went to. And Rodney is really, truly setting an example to young people to see that their futures are intact. I got to be principal here at Stanford High. Um, the principal um, went on to another school, and last year they were looking for somebody to hold it down. And um, they asked me. And I came over here last year um, as the principal, and this year we've been able to reduce the number of fights and hopefully instill some pride and reinstill some pride into people that they're going to respect each other. And hopefully I can, can continue that, uh, modeling that type of behavior for next year. Um, life is too short for us to waste every opportunity on trying to bite, bite and devour each other. And um, as my friends and brothers and sisters that I've known and loved for 30 and 40 years here in Stanford, I think we all still have a deep compassion and drive to kind of give something back to the young people so that they can go on and achieve the things that they really were destined to achieve. Um, if you look behind me, you'll see uh, something called ROP, the Rites of Passage. Um, every year we take um, up to 20 students to West Africa after having uh, a course, 11 week course, in where they came from and where they're going. And this course encompasses all of the information that often escapes us in terms of our history books about the richness of Africa and how people endured the Middle Passage and have come to make some incredible contributions in America to have America be what it is today on the backs of slaves and, and so many contributions and inventions that were done by, by black people. So in doing this, we take kids back to Africa to the door of no return and invalidate that concept of no return. I wish that every black person would go back to, South, to West Africa and the door of no return so that we can invalidate that concept of not returning and thereby linking our very rich cultural heritage of the past to our very rich cultural heritage that we now have in America. And we can move forward, not thinking that we have to be second-class citizens, but knowing that we come from a rich people and a strong people and we can do anything we set our minds to. That's why I guess I'm in education, because I believe that through education and through faith and through family, People can get it done. Angela Edwards. Her and I grew up together and went to school together. Angela is a phenomenal woman. She has taken it upon herself to see that young African-American kids get the privilege to tour African-American historical colleges throughout the country. Angela, we salute you. Hi, I'm Angela. And uh, most of you know me as being raised on the south end of Stanford. Um, and uh, I attended college in North Carolina. And coming back, I realized that a lot of our students were not aware of historical black colleges. So that's where we are today to talk about what I do and how I impact students here in Stanford. Uh, the name of the program is the William E. Edwards Academic College Tours Incorporated, better known as WEAC. And we take students as well as families to visit historical black colleges. Um, it has really done well. 85% of our students from this area end up attending one of the historical black colleges that they were not aware of. So it has made an impact on students as well as families here in Stanford. Um, it, no, I know it impacted me when I visited a college um, campus and had not even realized the, the number of historical black colleges that were established. So here I am trying to get back to the community where I was raised because um, I just feel that it's important to work with our young people and I hope that everybody else will too. Just take a minute to tell one of them that you love them. Growing up in Stanford, Connecticut in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were so many love stories that came about. Some lasted a season, some lasted for years. Some love was lost, 
some love was found. This, this love story is unique in that it is the story of a love that was thought to be lost, but later was found. John and I first met when we were in high school at the tender age of 15. We were young and so in love, but of course it didn't last. And as we became adults, we saw each other in passing every now and then. I left the state of Connecticut in 1976 and relocated to Baltimore, Maryland. Whenever I got together with my friends, Brenda and Candy, his name would often come up. However, no one had seen him in years. In June of 2005, my friends convinced me to go to Connecticut to the blast. At that time, my mom was in poor health and I was hesitant about going, but they quickly reminded me that I had two grown daughters who could look after my mom and that everyone would be expecting me. So I decided to go, not knowing that John was also planning to go. When he arrived, he quickly found me in a crowd and came over to say hi. He looked exactly the same as when I had last seen him over 30 years ago, except he was no longer little John Gray. He had bulked up pretty good. <laughs> He quickly said that he had something to tell me that he had been holding for years. He proceeded to say that he knew that I was probably married, but he had never stopped loving me. After the shock wore off, I told him that I wasn't married and thanked him for telling me how he felt. Later that evening, we danced a slow dance and it felt amazing to be back in his arms. I gave him my cell phone number before I left town and asked him to keep in touch, which he did. Two weeks later, I received a beautiful flower arrangement at my job. We talked on the phone every day, at least five times a day, since that chance meeting. I mean, he had singular and so did I. It was like everything was really put into place for us. In September, him and I met again and spent some time together. He asked me to marry him and I accepted. We got married on December 29, 2005. We really couldn't afford a big wedding thing, so we got married at the courthouse in front of my mom and children. Prior to John and I reuniting, I was fortunate to win airline tickets in a radio contest, which we used to fly to Las Vegas for a mini honeymoon the week of Valentine's Day. All my life I have been searching for the love of my life. Little did I know that I had already met him at the tender age of 15. Okay, another picture. Oh. Now here's a picture that was taken of us when, when we met we, in September. When we met in September. Yeah. The Newton's residence in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Rob and Candy, we can't forget you, baby. That's right. They're responsible for this. They would not let me say no about coming to the blast. It's beautiful. Carl, we want to thank you, my cousin, for taking the time to come down here to. Uh, tell our story because we feel that it's very important to know that if it wasn't for the blast, this wouldn't have came about. Not at all. And we're looking forward to going back to the blast this year. And we just we just wanted everyone to know that the blast from the past will last. <laughs> like our love. That's yes. Right. Okay. Okay, my hair is flying, but that's okay. Good. All right, yes. Now, now we get another. There you go. Another beautiful day in the Baltimore Harbor. Yes. Yeah. All right. You know, you know, John, Brenda. Everywhere I go, when I would talk about the blast and talk about you all, I always tell people you're still on your honeymoon. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're still on your honeymoon. Oh yeah. I always consider myself. I still consider myself a newlywed. You know, and it's very obvious, because every time I talk to John on the phone, man, he's, he can hear the love for you in his voice. I love her. She's worth loving. Yes, indeed. She's a good person. And, and this is also to show some of our family and friends, man, from back in the day that, you know, that life evolves. People change. We, you know, we did crazy stuff growing up. We did stuff, man, that... Something you said at Robin Candy's house, at, at, at Brenda, I mean, um, I'm sorry, at uh, Lewis, Lewis and, and it seems, uh, uh, reception. How you said, before you said the, the prayer, before, when we was getting ready to eat, how it was very, 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 we are very blessed, beyond measure, just to 
all of us who were there we stand yeah, in that room. Yeah. Because in Stanford, things came at us that we just really didn't understand. That's right. When it came to the drugs, the poverty, and all that. For one thing, we didn't know we were poor for the most part. We didn't. No, not at all. We, 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 we had real childhoods. Mm -hmm. We didn't know we were poor, but, but something you said, John, in that prayer was very important. That we were all blessed to be in that same room. Right. Rob, Candy, you know, uh, Blood. I mean, all of us who were there. Right. It's also a blessing that we all can get together. The reason why my wife and I are really looking forward to going to the blast, not only because we met there, because it gives us the opportunity to see people that we haven't seen in 20 or 30 years. And who knows what tomorrow brings. You know, so we're going because we know we're going to see people that we haven't seen in a while and we may never see again. That's right. You know, right. but I do want to acknowledge one thing. My grandmother said to me when I was a kid and uh, Brenda and I were together and we had split up and she asked me what happened. And I really couldn't explain it to her because I guess by being young, you have a lot of wild oats to sow. But one thing she said to me that really stood out, she said that... You would never meet another girl like her. And that's something that stayed with me all that time. And, and when we were dancing that night, I heard something in my right ear. And it said to me, now is the time to tell her how you feel and how you've been feeling all this time. Not expecting anything in return, I just wanted her to know I felt and what I've been carrying around because as fine as she is who would know that she wasn't married so I wasn't expecting anything and I thank God that I had a grandmother that could see mm -hmm, what my grandmother saw because I believe with all my heart that it was my grandmother that was speaking to me telling me now was the time to tell her how you felt you know and I have I have never heard that voice before and I have never heard it since and I knew that the time was right for our hearts to come together. That's why I know it's such a blessing for us to be together and I love this woman with all my heart and as long as I live I'm going to do everything humanly possible to make both of our dreams come true. So anyone that's listening to this tape let me be first to say when you latch on to something that's good hold on for dear life because who knows if you're going to be as fortunate as I was to get a second opportunity. God is good.